This is Dr. Marnie Peterson. I'm the Outreach Coordinator for the Antimicrobial Stewardship Project, which was launched recently by the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy at the University of Minnesota. A component of this project are live webinars with global experts in the field of antimicrobial stewardship and antibiotic resistance. It's my pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar, The Future of Antibiotics and Resistance, with Dr. Brad Spelberg. Dr. Spelberg is Chief Medical Officer at the Los Angeles County University of Southern California Medical Center. He's also a Professor of Clinical Medicine and Associate Dean for Clinical Affairs at the Keck School of Medicine at USC. His impact on the field of infectious diseases is extensive. As a clinician and antimicrobial steward, researcher in the development of new antimicrobials and author of numerous articles and books, he has worked extensively with the Infectious Diseases Society of America and policymakers to bring attention to the problems of increasing drug resistance and decreasing new antibiotics. The agenda for today's one-hour webinar is the presentation from Dr. Brad Spelberg, followed by time available to address questions and comments from the participants. At any time, you as a participant are welcome to submit questions and comments in writing via the WebEx chat box located at the bottom right corner of your screen. When typing in the question, please make sure to send your question to both the host and presenter. Please be aware that all lines will be muted during the webinar. Dr. Spelberg, thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much, Marty, for the introduction. It's um, a pleasure and an honor to be the inaugural, inaugural webinar speaker for SIDREP. I think SIDREP is going to have an enormous impact on infectious diseases and antibiotic resistance specifically in the coming years, and I look forward to working with you all. So we'll spend the next maybe 45, 50 minutes talking about the future of antibiotics and resistance, and um, hopefully the volume is adequate. Let me know if not. Um, I think to start off, we're going we're gonna to try to challenge some longstanding assumptions and uh, see if we can disrupt. That's going to be the goal. So there are going to be some suggestions I'm going to make that may be contrary to what people typically hear. That, that's a good thing. That's the goal. But let's start off with really understanding what antibiotics do, what they bring to us. Okay, so these, there we go. So it's very important to realize that antibiotics cause the largest declines in death from any intervention that you'll find in medicine across a variety of types of invasive infections. These are absolute reductions in death with antibiotics compared to the pre-antibiotic era. For comparison's sake, even a simple skin infection, what we call today a cellulitis, in the pre-antibiotic era had a death rate about 11%, which was the same as the death rate for heart attacks. Who remembers that? We don't remember how bad it was that you could have a skin infection cause the same death rate as a heart attack before antibiotics were available. And the reductions in death that you get with antibiotics are far greater than the 3% reduction in death you get from aspirin or clot-busting drugs in patients who have heart attacks. And so it's not surprising that with this power suddenly available that the medical community developed hubris and began to think, well, infections are now conquered, let's move on to more important topics. And we, of course, did not understand for a long time the ability of, of bacteria to adapt and develop resistance. And as resistance has continued to spread over the decades, unfortunately, our new antibiotic development is not keeping pace. So this graph shows the number of new antibiotics approved by the FDA per five-year period. And I don't think it takes a statistician to see the trend. A remarkable decline in the number of antibiotics approved per five-year period. Now, much has been made of the fact that in the current five-year period, we seem to be off rock bottom. I expect this will go up by one or two more before the end of 2017. And so people have said, look, things are getting better. Big companies have gotten out, but small companies are stepping in to fill the breach and things are turning around and that's all good. And I would just caution you all 
that while, yes, it's true the pipeline is thicker than it was five years ago, if you look at what's coming out of small companies, it's stuff we don't need. So this is a list of the antibiotics approved over the last two five-year periods since 2009. And you can see that every time thus far a small company has brought a drug through FDA to market, it's been for MRSA skin infections, of which there is no current need for new drugs. In fact, I'm sick of MRSA skin infection drugs. If I get one more MRSA skin infection drug, I'm going to have a seizure. I can't stand MRSA skin infection drugs. Enough with the MRSA skin infection drugs. We have lots of needs, and that's not one of them. And if you look at the drugs that we do need that have been approved, the first, Bidacolin, was approved to treat MDRTB, was developed by a public-private partnership, not even a for-profit entity, a not-for-profit entity. The second, most recently, Cazabi, was developed, you know, principally to hit very resistant gram-negative bacilli. And as we'll talk about, that's the biggest unmet need. That was developed by a big company, which promptly upon approval of that drug, turned around and got rid of its entire antibacterial program. Became the latest big company to do that. So let's not be falsely reassured that as small companies move into the game, this problem is going to be solved. The companies need to develop drugs we need, not drugs that are safe and easy for them to develop. If you look at what the priorities of unmet need are right, right now, <laughs> the number one prior, the, the biggest category of unmet need is extreme drug resistant and pan drug resistant gram negative bacteria. So extreme drug resistant, it's resistant to everything except stuff that we know is not safe or not very effective. Colistin tigacycline, for example. Pan drug resistant, resistant to everything. These generally are healthcare-associated infections, carbapenem resistant enterobacteriaceae, or CRE, Pseudomonas. And the thing that I think is actually the top priority right now is Acinetobacter. Why? Because it has, as I'll show you, the highest percentage of carbapenem resistance, which is the best surrogate for XDR status. And its pipeline is the thinnest. We actually do have a phase two and three pipeline for CRE, and we've had a recent Pseudomonas drug. The acinetobacter pipeline is much thinner. When you go below the XDR PDR gram negatives, the next level that we really have a major unmet need for, and I think this is not very well appreciated, um, is we have sort of a burgeoning public health crisis, which has just peaked above the water level. The media has not really caught on to this yet. <clears throat> these are community onset infections. In contrast to the XDR infections, these are not healthcare associated necessarily. We see patients come in with no healthcare contact who are infected by gram negatives that are not resistant to everything, but they're resistant to everything oral. And so millions of urinary tract infections per year, uh, kidney infections, abdominal infections, prostate infections, which in the past you just gave Cipro to, and you didn't even have to get a culture. You just knew the Cipro would work, the patient went on their way, and they did just fine. We are rapidly losing the quinolones. In the United States, 20 to 30 percent of community E. coli is now fluoroquinolone resistant. That is an astounding increase in the last decade. 10, 15 years ago, that number was less than 1%. We can no longer trust that the quinolones will work, and those strains resistant to quinolones are typically resistant to other oral antibiotics as well, and there is no oral antibiotic in the pipeline with gram-negative activity that can replace the quinolones. This is a huge unmet need that has not been appreciated. Do we need MRSA drugs <clears throat> not for skin and not for lung? <clears throat> We could use a new MRSA drug that is more effective than vancomycin for bloodstream infections. We do not have such a drug right now. We could use a safe oral MRSA drug for chronic therapy for bone infections or prosthetic joint infections. We certainly continue to need TB drugs. Gonorrhea is an unmet need, and I think that's gotten a lot of attention. I will just point out, however, the pipeline for gonorrhea is very robust it turns out not to be so hard to discover new gonorrhea antibiotics. So I think in the next couple of years, we will have new therapies for gonorrhea. The scary current state of resistance is underscored by national surveillance data. So if you look across USICUs, 
10% of Klebsiella, 20% of Pseudomonas, and an appalling 50% of Acinetobacter in US ICUs are now carbapenem resistant. As I mentioned, that's the best surrogate for XDR status. The level of XDR phenotypes in these gram negatives in our hospitals in the United States is really bad, but it's even worse in other countries. In the Asian and Latin American countries and in Southern Europe, the resistance rates, the carbapenem resistance rates, particularly for Acinetobacter, may exceed 60 to 70% in some countries, maybe even higher. The problem with the XDR phenotype, the reason it matters is because it kills people. Very simple. An XDR gram negative has triple to quadruple the mortality rate during an invasive infection compared to the same types of bacteria when they're not XDR. 30 to 40% mortality rates across the board. If it's in the blood, or if you have ventilator-associated pneumonia from these pathogens, you're talking about 50% mortality rates. It's a coin toss, live or die with modern medical therapy. And if the initial therapy given is not colistin and is ineffective, it's even higher. This is 1934-era death rates. This is pre-antibiotic-era death rates. Now, all of this has led a certain clinical expert who has highly underdeveloped frontal lobes and tends to say things that pop into his mind, said to Andy Pollack at the New York Times, for these infections, we're back to dancing around a bubbling cauldron while rubbing two chicken bones together. Andy chose to put that quote on the front page of the New York Times, and I subsequently suffered much ribbing for having said this. But you know what? I stand by it. The experience of caring for a patient with an XDR or PDR infection is a very uncomfortable one. You are throwing a witch's brew of combinations of antibiotics at the patient, knowing that no drug by itself is going to work and hoping some magical combination will do better. So that brings us to this statement. I always wanted to go into medicine, but I was never much of a dancer right? That's not the way medicine is supposed to be practiced in the 21st century. We have a problem. Why do we have this problem? You hear this all the time. We have to, we have to strike back in the war against microbes. You've got to win the war against microbes. Really? We're going to win a war against organisms that outnumber us by 10 to the 22 they're so numerous that despite being microscopic, they outweigh us 100 million times. They replicate 500,000 times faster than we can, and they've been doing this for 10,000 times longer than our species has existed. I don't think we're going to win a war against them. I just lost this. Oh, here we go. I don't think that's going to happen. <clears throat> Not only are these organisms incredibly numerous, but they have an unbelievable ability to develop uh, to adapt to their environment. And the way that they adapt to their environment is by exchanging DNA, by swapping DNA. Bacteria, particularly gram-negatives, can exchange DNA across phyla. Humans, of course, can only do this within our own species. So just as a thought experiment to illustrate the power, the adaptive power of cross-phylum genetic exchange, what would it mean if humans could exchange DNA across phyla as bacteria do. We would have to be able to exchange DNA with a chimp, with an orangutan, with a grizzly bear, a tiger, a walrus, or a killer whale. That last one would be pretty cool, actually. I'd like to see what came out of that. A falcon, a great white shark, a frog, a crocodile, or my personal favorite, the sea squirt all of which are in our phyla, and bacteria can do this. So the point is illustrated, when one of them knows how, when one of them learns how to do something, they're all very soon gonna know how to do it because they're just gonna swap their DNA across phyla and every bacteria exposed to an antibiotic is gonna to learn to become resistant to it. Boy, I'll tell you though, we sure do our best to help educate them. <clears throat> The amount of the antibiotic selective pressure that we apply to the environment every year just in the United States 
is staggering. 40 million pounds of antibiotics in the United States per year. You're talking about on the order of 20 to 21,000 tons of antibiotics every year just in the U.S. Globally, the number, of course, is much higher. China adds a huge amount, probably on the order of 150,000 tons of antibiotics per year across the globe. What is often not appreciated is that 80% of that use is for animals. Most of it is not to treat sick animals, it's to growth promote livestock. Only 20% is used in humans. And even more scary is that we've been sounding the alarm about antibiotic resistance and the need to not waste antibiotics for 15 years or longer. But over the last five, six, seven years, while we were screaming about the problems of resistance, the use to growth promote in animals actually increased in the United States by 20%. Washington, we have a real problem. Now, all of this has been very pithily summarized by the late, great Nobel laureate, Josh Letterberg, who wrote in Science over 15 years ago now, the future of humanity and microbes will likely evolve as episodes of our wits versus their genes. And the sad thing is that in, in the years since he wrote this, while bacteria have continued to use their genes to adapt, we stopped using our wits to keep up. So why is this? Why do we have a market failure of antibiotics? Well, we, we have three converging causes. The science has really become quite hard because the antibiotics that are easy to discover have been discovered. The low-hanging fruit has been plucked. It's increasingly expensive and difficult to find the next generation of drugs. Antibiotics are not a good investment for R&D dollars in the industry. Companies make much more money investing in drugs you have to take every day for the rest of your life. Diabetes, cholesterol, dementia, arthritis, et cetera. We'll talk a little bit about at the end, the regulatory environment in the United States has been, I would describe, almost overtly hostile to new antibiotic development for a long time now. And that's made clinical trials much more expensive and much more risky than they used to be. And so each of these factors combines, and we have a collapse of the antibiotic pipeline. So let me summarize. We're running out of antibiotics. Resistance continues to spread at alarming rates. We have scientific challenges to discover new antibiotics. The economics for discovery are unfavorable. The regulations are obstructive. What companies have been developing, I by and large don't need. Other than this, we're doing great. So the future is actually pretty easy to predict. We've learned there are three inevitable truths of life, death, taxes, and resistance. Which brings me to one of the national experts in healthcare quality who has said every system is perfectly designed to produce the results it gives. So here's the point. <clears throat> this mess we're in with antibiotics, it's not an accident. That happenstance. The resistance problems we have today should happen if you use, develop, and protect antibiotics the way we've done so for the last 80 years. This is what's supposed to happen, which means that if we want the next 80 years to look differently, we're going to need to challenge some long standing assumptions and think disruptively. And when people say things like, well, that's just not how we do it. The proper response is, well, that's why we have such a mess. So you need to change how you do it. So let's talk, for example, about antibiotic stewardship. There's been a lot of attention recently, renewed attention to antibiotic stewardship, which is great. We need to do much better. But let me just point out, stewardship is not new. The concept of antibiotic stewardship dates back 70 years. The man who discovered penicillin warned the public in a New York Times interview in 1945 that we were already wasting penicillin. And the people wasting penicillin were breeding out penicillin-resistant bacteria, which were killing people. And the people who were wasting the penicillin were therefore sort of morally responsible for those deaths. And he said that he hoped this evil could be averted. It, of course, has not been. It's 70 years later, we're having the same discussions. How are we doing 70 years after Fleming warned us not to waste antibiotics? Well, here's two recent studies just came out this month in JAMA Internal Medicine, or, or one study in an editorial that references a second study. The first study looked at inpatient use of antibiotics and they found no decline in antibiotic use over the last decade, 
And in fact, broad spectrum antibiotic use went up. Does that sound like our stewardship efforts have been effective? In the second study, <clears throat> which is referenced in this wonderful editorial by Marotra and Linder, there was an initial decline, a modest decline in outpatient uh, use in the US, but that decline rapidly plateaued and broad spectrum antibiotic use actually went up. So really, while we've renewed attention to stewardship, we have not yet found the secret sauce to make stewardship work to get doctors to prescribe fewer antibiotics. Why is this? What do we think the problems are? I think one of the fundamental problems with traditional stewardship approaches is that they've been entirely focused at the tactical level on the ground in the hospital. They talk about things like restricting antibiotics up front, de-escalating antibiotics downstream, having care pathways, putting electronic medical record pathways in place, building relationships with providers, who should be on the stewardship team, should it be a doctor, a pharmacist, both, et cetera. What we have not focused on is how to, at the strategic level, at a level above the tactics, how to convince the providers to actually buy in, how to get them to actually comply. How do you fundamentally alter human behavior? How do you um, ameliorate the fear of the unknown, the fear of being wrong, which is actually what motivates people to prescribe all these antibiotics? And we've had no focus on grand strategy, a level even above provider behavior. This is about society. This is about how do you convince the hospital C-suite, the CFO of the hospital, the CMO of the hospital, the CEO, to put teeth into its stewardship program so that when the surgeons come complain that their, their practice is being impinged upon, the response of people like me, a CMO, is not to say to your stewardship team, stop messing with my cardiothoracic surgeons, stop messing with my neurosurgeons, stop messing with my transplant doctors. They bring in all the money that floats this facility. If you upset them, they will take their business elsewhere. How do you convince us at the CMO level, at the C-suite level, or at the regulatory level, the joint commission level? How do you convince payers that they should all align to help put teeth into stewardship so that doctors and patients have their incentives aligned with the societal interest of decreasing antibiotic usage? We have not had a dialogue on this topic. The fact is we need to decide if we're serious about this or not, because local tactics don't work if they're not backed up by higher level strategy and grand strategy. The CMO is not gonna support the stewardship team if the neurosurgeon says, I'm walking if you don't back off. The, the dollars speak, right? You know how many times I've heard stewardship leads at hospitals tell me I'd love to implement antibiotic restrictions, but our docs won't tolerate it? We need to get serious about building a strategic framework and a grand strategic framework so that the local tactics can be effective, so that we convince doctors and patients, no, you don't want the antibiotic. Flip the script. Don't ask for the antibiotic. Only take it if you really need it. We also, sadly, have never developed a consensus definition of what inappropriate antibiotic use is. And I will tell you, if you can't define it, you can't reduce it. People think, oh, it's obvious what it is. Turns out not so. When you ask payers, when you ask regulators, when you ask many experts, <clears throat> how do you decide if it's appropriate or not? What they'll tell you is, well, it's appropriate if it's on label and it's inappropriate if it's off label. Or they'll tell you it's appropriate if the societal guidelines recommend it. I got, an, I got a concept for you here. Sorry, that's wrong. The FDA approved indication has virtually nothing to do with whether the use of an antibiotic is appropriate or not. Very different than other types of drugs, and I realize that, but that's an important concept. Antibiotics are not like other drugs. I'm gonna explain more in a minute. FDA indication has very little to do with appropriate use, and in most of the current guidelines, the guidelines do not reflect necessarily appropriate use. Why? For most types of drugs, the indication for which they have been proven safe and effective in large clinical trials defines their appropriate use. If they are safe and effective for that use, it's appropriate. If they have not been proven safe and effective, it's not appropriate. This is very different for antibiotics. The reason is safety and efficacy is not enough 
for an antibiotic to be appropriate. You also have to consider the spectrum of activity and the alternative agents that are available. If you take a broad spectrum gram negative drug with pseudomonal activity and use it to treat a group A strep infection that penicillin remains 100% effective for, that is inappropriate use. And I don't care if the pseudomonally active agent is safe and effective. You've wasted a drug which needs to be preserved for people who have very little us to treat and used it on a patient, we've got 40 other drugs you could have used to treat. That is inappropriate. So safe and effective is not enough to define appropriate use. Here are several examples where not only are the pseudomonally active agents FDA approved for the diseases in question, but the national guidelines say they are fine to use first line because they're safe and effective. And I will tell you, all of these reflect inappropriate use, and they're very common, very common. Quinolone use for CAP, surprisingly common in hospitals. Quinolone or zosin for skin infections, inappropriate, but consistent with FDA label and with national guidelines. The other problems with using the label, to, the FDA label to define appropriate uses, as we said, safety and efficacy is not enough. But the other issue is <clears throat> the way that antibiotic trials have been done for a long time is they study one site of infection at a time. But we know that's not how bacteria work. Bacteria can infect any part of the body. But for historical reasons, and we need to change this, this is one of the things we need to change, if you're going to develop another drug, you're going to study a urinary tract infection trial. It's not a pseudomonas infection trial. You're not studying the bug. You're studying the site of infection. It's not possible for companies to do trials for every possible site of infection. So, for example, we have cas Abbey approved now to treat CRE, deadly, highly resistant bacteria. The drug was studied for urinary tract infections and abdominal infections. So are you telling me if I have a CRE bacteria that's resistant to everything else in the lung or in the brain that I shouldn't use cas Abbey to treat it because it's not on the label? That's ridiculous. Of course, that's silly. At the same time, if I've got a really susceptible E. coli in the urine, should I waste my cas Abbey on that susceptible E. coli even though it's in the label? No, that's inappropriate. Finally, the other problem with the label for defining appropriate use is that resistance patterns change over time, but, but approval labels do not. So when a drug first comes out, it may hit a bunch of bacteria. Ten years later, it may no longer hit those bacteria, but it's still labeled for them. So we need to get past the FDA label. We need to get past national guidelines. Appropriate use is, needs to consider more than just safety and efficacy. This tells us that our guidelines should change and should reflect not just safety and efficacy, but spectrum of activity. And if you want to go even a step more radical, what I would love to see is statutory change that enables the FDA to consider more than just safety and efficacy when it labels a drug so that it can place restrictions on drugs in the label to limit marketing. That's the importance of the label. The label limits corporate marketing, and marketing is what drives clinical use. There's a reason companies spend way more money every year on marketing than they do on <clears throat> R&D for new drugs. Most inappropriate antibiotic use in the United States is on label. The bulk of inappropriate use is outpatient upper respiratory tract infections, and the antibiotics have labels for those indications. So most inappropriate antibiotic use, very different than other types of drugs, is on label, not off label. So let me take you through a couple of common scenarios so you get a flavor of what people who do stewardship have to deal with. These are real scenarios. Okay, They've come up over and over. So you're holding the antibiotic pager. The intern on surgery calls you. Yeah, I've got a patient with, pick your disease, because it's happened with all of them. Perp appendicitis, cholecystitis, that's an infection of the gallbladder, cholangitis. Yeah, we have them on ceftriaxone and metronidazole, but they're spiking fevers through those drugs, so clearly that's not enough. We need to broaden out. I need zosin. And you say, whoa, 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 whoa. This was a community onset infection, right? Why would there be pseudomonas in there? Zosin is for pseudomonas. Why would you need pseudomonal coverage? Oh, no, 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 I'm not saying it's pseudomonas. No, 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 but they're spiking through what they're on, so I need broader stuff. And it's like, well, no, what you need to do is take them to the OR. 
right? Antibiotics aren't going to fix this. Take them to the OR. Zosin doesn't kill susceptible E. coli any better than ceftriaxone. Why would you need pseudomonas? This isn't pseudomonas. Now, here's the thing. <clears throat> I'm an antibiotic Nazi. I don't like to give antibiotics. And I'm an expert in antibiotics. And while this intern is begging me for the Zosin, and I'm telling him it can't be pseudomonas because it's community onset, the fear that he's experiencing, which is causing him to ask for the Zosin, that fear is contagious. It seems to be able to transmit through the phone line, the molecules of fear, the, the quarks, or I don't know what it is, the neutrinos of fear, seem to transmit through electrons through the phone line. And here's what I'm thinking. Here's what the antibiotic Nazi is thinking. Zosin is not right here. I'm not going to prove the Zosin. But you know what? I know how the universe works. The more strident I am, the more insistent I am that this is not pseudomonas, the more likely it is that the universe is going to make it pseudomonas just to spite me, right? So I'm susceptible to this fear. What does the average physician in practice who does not spend their days thinking about antibiotic resistance have a chance to fend this off? Here's another scenario, okay? The ED, emergency department or medicine resident calls you, yeah, I've got a patient with gram negatives in the urine. Do they have symptoms? No, 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 but they have gram negatives in the urine, so I need some, some fluoroquinolone. Yeah, but they don't have symptoms. That's asymptomatic bacteria. We, we don't treat that. Oh, no, I know, but there's gram negatives in the urine, so I need the antibiotics. I mean, that's literally a quote-unquote conversation I've had, right? What they're experiencing is fear. It's not rational. They're afraid. They have a sick patient in front of them. They don't know what to do. There's bacteria in the urine. They want to treat it. Now, here's the thing. Take that same provider. <clears throat> Give them a board exam. Put the question on the boards. Do they know that they're not supposed to treat asymptomatic bacteria? Of course. If they took that question on the boards, they would get it right. A board exam is not a sick patient. A board exam causes a very different type of fear than a sick patient. This is about fear, not education. It turns out, I've said publicly many times, Antibiotics are among the most potent of all psychoactive drugs. They just work on the prescriber instead of the patient. They're incredibly potent to anti-angiolytics. When we prescribe antibiotics, we feel so much better. We're very afraid. We don't know what's going on. We give six antibiotics. We feel better. May not help the patient, but we feel better. It's like hooking yourself up to some propofol. It makes you feel good, okay? This is about fear. And fear is not going to be overcome by rational education. This is why, in partnership with <clears throat> Arjun Srinivasan at CDC and Chip Chambers at UCSF, we put out this viewpoint in JAMA earlier in the year. We wanted to make the point that, there, that antibiotics are unique. They are different from all other drugs because only they have transmissible resistance. The ones that work today won't work in the future. They have to be continually replaced. And every person's use affects everyone else. When you use an antibiotic, it affects my future ability to use them. And when I use them, it affects your future grandchildren's ability to use them. Antibiotics are shared societal trust. That's not true of any other type of drug. We are all in this together. So when a doctor says, how dare you restrict my ability to prescribe antibiotics, Societally, the proper response is, no, I do have the right to restrict them because you're doing it wrong. And no one has a right to waste these drugs. Wasting them hurts everyone. So it is fear, for the most part, that drives much of the inappropriate antibiotic use. It's not fear of lawsuits. It's fear of having a sick patient that you don't know what to do with that you may hurt if you don't give the antibiotic. One way to alleviate that fear is to have better diagnostic tests so we know what we're treating. These technologies are in development. They're starting to come to market. We need to figure out a way to encourage their use, which is likely going to require different payment models to break siloed hospital budgeting. So the lab director doesn't want to bust their budget on bringing a new diagnostic in in order to save the pharmacy director's budget for antibiotics. We have to figure out creative payment models to encourage the use of such technologies. But we also need a strategy 
as I mentioned before, to convince providers to do the right thing, to counter the fear. And there's been shockingly little research on psychological approaches to support stewardship. The two most impactful studies to come out in the last decade in this space, both came out of the USC Schaefer Center for Health Economics, Daniela Meeker and Jason Doctor. So here was the first study a couple years ago. They used something called a gentle nudge approach. What they did is they had doctors sign a statement, commitment, saying they wouldn't waste antibiotics on viral infections. And they posted that signed statement with a picture of the doctor in the exam room so that both the doctor and the patient were staring at it during the patient encounter. That intervention, that's all they did, cost nothing, used no technology, very simple. That intervention reduced antibiotic prescribing by 20% during influenza season. This is based on this public commitment concept, and I called it judo, antibiotic judo, because instead of going directly after doctors and nagging them or wagging your finger in their face, they used the doctor's own psychological momentum against themselves. This was sort of a very clever, gentle way to psychologically align the doctor's self-interest with the societal interest to reduce prescriptions. This needs to be spread. The next study that was brought out by this group came out this year in JAMA. They studied three different tech psychological methods. One is audit and feedback. They simply gave report cards back to providers and said, for acute bronchitis, you prescribed antibiotics this percent of the time. The top 10 performers did much better than you. Turns out doctors <clears throat> are very competitive. They don't like to be at the bottom of the performance pack. And so they respond to audit and feedback. They also built in the electronic medical record a window that would pop up and say, you're prescribing antibiotics for acute bronchitis. Please justify why this is necessary because we don't typically need to give antibiotics for this indication. And then had a window that said, if you'd rather, instead of an antibiotic, you could prescribe Tylenol or other things. Um, the first two methods statistically substantially reduced antibiotic prescriptions. The last method non-significantly trended towards improved prescriptions. But again, the point here is <clears throat> these, are, these are relatively simple psychological approaches and we need much more investigation. There should be funding made or programs, RFPs put out to fund how we align strategically the psychological behavior of providers with the local tactics we use to control stewardship. We also need to confront an urban legend. This is a really widespread belief. There's this thing that you hear all the time. If you don't want to get resistance, keep taking your antibiotics till they're gone, even after you feel better. How many times have you heard people say that over the years? The problem is there's no science to support it, and it doesn't make sense. That's not how natural selection works. The longer you take the antibiotic, the more resistance you will select in the bacteria in your body. If you keep taking the antibiotics after you're already better, you're getting no benefit. All you're getting is resistance selection. We need to get rid of this urban legend. It's very deeply ingrained. It needs to go away. It needs to be replaced by, if you feel better, give me a call, and maybe we can stop the antibiotics early. Really, the mantra needs to shift. This was a recent editorial I put out in JAMA I Am. We need to shift to a new antibiotic mantra. Shorter is better. <clears throat> when I'm on rounds on the ID service and people ask me how long to treat, I like to tell them that the data behind most of our treatment decisions for duration is based on a 1,695-year-old decree from Constantine the Great who decided there should be seven days in a week. That's why we treat infections for seven to 14 days. I refer to it as one to two Constantine units. Isn't it sad that in 2016 our treatment durations are based on a decree from a Roman emperor in 321 AD. In fact, every time we've done a randomized controlled trial across many different types of infections, comparing short course therapy to long course therapy, short course therapy is just as effective, and of course you'll get less resistance selection. We need to move to shorter and shorter durations of therapy. Finally, at the grand strategic level, how do you align hospital leadership, payers, and regulators to getting physicians to do what we want, which is less antibiotics. We need to publicly report antibiotic use, and we need to link 
usage to payment. So this is very analogous to infection prevention. You can mandate stewardship programs, which Medicare is now doing. That doesn't mean they're going to work. We had mandated infection prevention programs for decades, but they never prevented any infections. It wasn't until we publicly reported our hospital-acquired infection rates and financially penalized poor performing hospitals and rewarded better performing hospitals that we saw infection rates, hospital-acquired infection rates decline. The same thing will happen with antibiotic stewardship. It is not enough to have a stewardship program. The stewardship program needs to have teeth. It needs to be supported to be effective. So that's how we can do a better job of protecting antibiotics. How are we going to rekindle new therapies? We're going to talk about things to do to rekindle the pipeline, but I want to start with some alternative therapies because we need to relieve the pressure on antibiotics. We're always going to need antibiotics. They're too effective to discard. But maybe we can find alternative treatments that relieve the pressure on them, treatments that enhance immunity or, instead of killing bacteria, disarm them so they can't cause disease. This should cause less selective pressure to select out resistance. It's the killing action that causes the selective pressure. Maybe we can modulate host inflammation. Much of the symptoms of infection are caused by the host inflammatory response of bacteria. Maybe we can passively starve microbes, not kill them directly, but just hide nutrients they need so they can't get the nutrients to divide and replicate in the host. Maybe we can use probiotics to outcompete. Other paradigms of treatment, I think in the coming five to 10 years, we will begin to see treatments like this hit the market. As Gabe Gilbert has said, instead of killing bacteria, the ideal goal is to figure out how to achieve peaceful coexistence. For rekindling the pipeline, we need to admit, we need to admit something that is painful for industry to admit, but it's time. It's time to admit it. The for-profit motive has failed us. Big companies have quit the field. People have been falsely reassured by small company entrants. Small companies, their entire fate is anchored to the one drug in their portfolio. If that, if that drug goes up in flames, the entire company goes with it. The companies are governed largely by venture capitalists whose interest is a rapid return on investment. They're not interested in long-term unmet need to get the drug to market. They're interested in flipping the molecule to get a quick return on investment. The goal, therefore, for these companies often is to develop a drug in the cheapest, fastest, least risky way possible, having nothing to do with unmet need. And that's why we keep getting MRSA skin infection drugs. We can't make companies develop the new antibiotics we need. We have to figure out how to make them want to do this. This means we're going to need incentives to lure industry back, but they need to be powerful, they need to be targeted, and they need to be sustainable. The goal is not a one-time discovery of the next gorilla psyllin. It's a centuries to millennia long encouragement for new discovery. Really, the key here is push incentives that will encourage early discovery and investment. And that's going to largely focus on public-private partnerships, grants, contracts, tax credits, which will offset early costs. We also need to see streamlined development programs and clinical trials so that the clinical development takes less time, because time turns out to be the number one expense, as I'll talk about in a minute, and will co cost less money and take less time. That's a huge incentive, far more impactful, as we'll see, than pull incentives that kick in after a drug is already developed. Over the last decade, the public agency BARDA in Department of Health and Human Services has been the life support keeping the antibiotic pipeline alive in the United States. Um, we have an infrastructure now where NIH NIAD can help support preclinical through phase one development, and BARDA does phase two to three. There's a new program, CARBEX, which is in part funded by NIAD and BARDA and in part by European consortium that will help to get new preclinical translation done as well. These public-private partnerships are the linchpin right now of our, our, our pipeline. They have to be supported and expanded. As I mentioned, we also need better dis trial designs. <clears throat> it would be really great if we could figure out how to do a clinical trial of an infection where we could enroll a drug, to study a drug to hit an unmet need and enroll patients with a variety of types of infections in one trial. 
urinary tract infections, abdominal infections, lung infections, all enrolled in one trial will make the trial much more rapid to enroll, faster, less expensive trials using novel statistics. There is a trial design that has been funded by the Antibiotic Resistance Leadership Group at NIAD and has had academic FDA, BARDA, and industry input. This has been led by the Berry Consultants, Leaders in Bayes and Adaptive Trials. And they're going to present this design uh, in the D.C. area publicly on December 7th. So look for announcements on that. Hopefully, if that kind of platform trial can take off, it'll be much easier and less expensive to do antibiotic development. Much has been said about pull incentives, about luring companies in by having prizes. So if you develop a new antibiotic, we'll give you a billion dollar prize at the time the drug is approved. Or having guaranteed markets, so money is waiting for you when the drug is approved. There is a hidden cost to these pull incentives that we need to recognize, and the concept is called discounting. Discounting is a standard financial practice. It basically says future money is not worth the same amount as money today. If I give you $10 today, the present value of that is $10. If instead I give you an IOU, that in 10 years I'm going to give you $10, you're not going to pay $10 for that IOU. I may die in the 10 years. I may move away. You may not be able to find me. I may not have $10. There's risk. The more time that goes by, the more risk there is. So to calculate the value of that IOU today, we apply a discount to calculate its present value. The same thing is true with pull incentives. If you have a pull incentive that kicks in 13 years from now when the drug is approved for use in humans, it's going to be subject to economic discounting. So let's look at the cost of that. Using a standard annual pharmaceutical discount rate, which is 10% per year, reflecting a lot of risk of failing in drug development, if I promise you a billion dollar prize 13 years from now, today the present value of that prize is only $250 million. 75% of the value is eroded by future, by discounting. Small companies have even higher discount rates. They're more likely to go out of business. They're more likely to fail. At a 20 to 30% discount rate, a present value of a billion dollars in 13 years can be eroded to less than $10 million. Prizes and guaranteed markets are expensive. They're not politically, socially, or economically realistic in the United States. They may be more so in Europe, but not in the United States. And furthermore, the goal is not a one-time approval. How many billion dollar prizes do you think the public is gonna stand? We can't have indefinite billion dollar prizes. The goal is not to get one new drug approved. We need a long-term strategy. The best pull incentive really is higher pricing, and the way to get higher pricing is to meet an unmet need. That one is on industry. Stop developing Me Too drugs and start developing drugs for unmet need. You'll get better pricing, which is the best pull incentive you can get. Finally, let's talk about the regulatory situation. 15 years ago, the FDA began to revisit trial designs, specifically those called non-inferiority trials, which is how antibiotics are typically developed. After a decade of dialogue, which really the, the rethinking had a very negative impact on large farmers and willingness to stay in the field, there was you know tremendous numbers of hours spent dialoguing and a few years ago now, the head of drugs at FDA said publicly at a Brookings Institution meeting, it's time to reboot. So where have we gone since the reboot? <clears throat> um, there has been some progress. The, the FDA has eased off in some areas. As I list on this slide, I'm trying to speed up because we're going to try to finish in five minutes. But there has not been enough progress. We still have trial designs that are very difficult to enroll in the United States. We don't have clarity on the trial designs we need. Instead, we have trial designs clear for skin infections, which we don't need and which make no sense, as I'll talk about in a moment. So uh, there's many, for the sake of time, there's many ways I could discuss problems with the regulatory situation, but this one illustrates conceptually how disconnected we are. So the first thing I just have to tell you before we get into it is that I'm not making this up because you're gonna think you're making this up. There's no way this is the rule. You're, you're exaggerating, but I'm not. And here's the proof 
Go pull this guidance off the web. There's the link for you to pull it off the web. If you want to develop a drug for skin infections in the year 2016, the FDA tells you you need to ask if the drug is effective at day two to three of therapy. And your definition, not at the end of therapy, not when the patient completes therapy, but at days two to three of therapy. Your definition of success, the patient has been successfully treated, is if 20%, if they've had their lesion size shrink by 20%. So look, <clears throat> this is not a clinical issue. You don't have to be a physician. This is not a statistical issue. This is common sense. Let me just ask you, if you or your loved one had a big swollen area of infected skin that was hot and red and painful, if on day three of therapy, 80% of the infection remained, would you consider that infection to have been successfully treated? Of course not. That makes no sense. How did they get to this end point? They lifted it from two clinical trials published in 1937, and I'm not making this up. I'm going to show you the trials on the next slide. They like the trials because that, there are tables in these papers that publish the exact size of skin lesions each day on treatment. And so statisticians have felt greatly comforted that they can calculate precise efficacy estimates for how effective drugs are at shrinking lesion size over time. Now, let me point out there's plenty of other data to show that antibiotics are effective for skin infections. I told you they reduce death. But all of the other data has been ignored except for these two studies. And here are the two studies. Here's the link. You can download them off the web. They're freely available at the British Medical Journal. These studies took patients with skin infections, and, and they didn't have the technology for randomization, and they didn't have the technology for placebo in 1937. So what they did is they alternated patients. Every other patient got oral sulfur antibiotics, and every other patient got UV lamp therapy, which was the standard of care before sulfur. You would come to the hospital with a skin infection, they would shine a UV lamp on your body, and if you survived, you'd go home with a nice suntan, and that's the way skin infections were treated before sulfur. UV lamp therapy was so ineffective that the infections grew larger for days on therapy. So the docs had a really low bar. They just wanted the infection to stop getting worse. Forget curing it. They just wanted the sulfur to make the infection stop getting bigger. Now, these actually were very careful investigators, and they tell us in the papers that they were careful to standardize all elements of background medical care so that the only two variables under study was sulfur antibiotic versus UV lamp therapy. For example, they tell us in the manuscripts that they were, that they, that every patient with skin infection was put on a liquid diet therapy and it had a very specific recipe. It included Horlicks malted milk, arrowroot, and junket. And by God, if you had a skin infection, you were not going to eat onions and eggs. And they specifically tell us that in the manuscripts. Now, why were they doing this? Did they think Horlicks malted milk was an effective treatment for skin infections and onions made skin infections worse? No. <clears throat> they were doing this because before antibiotics came along, there were no effective therapies. So what doctors gave you as treatment were placebos to make you feel better, to make you feel that something was being done for you. Otherwise, why would you go to the doctor? That's what this was. It was a functional placebo to make you feel like the doctor was doing something for you. But it wasn't the only standard therapy that all patients with skin infections were given in these trials. The authors go on to tell us this is a direct quote. On admission, each patient was given a soap and water enema, which was repeated when necessary. Now, did the doctors think that soap and water enemas were, uh, this is, by the way, with hot liquid paraffin squirted in your rectum. Did the doctors think this was an effective therapy for skin infections? Of course not. But I submit to you, having a squirt gun jammed up your rectum and getting blasted in your colon with a hot liquid paraffin soap and water enema would indeed leave the impression with the patient that something had been done. And that's why they were doing it. So what's the point? Here's the point. These two trials with their Horlicks malted milk and their arrowroot and their junket and their no eggs or onions and their hot liquid paraffin enemas, 
are the singular basis for regulatory review of skin infection studies in 2016. If that doesn't illustrate how far off kilter we are in the regulatory space in antibiotics, I don't know what will. So let's wrap up. We need healthcare policies that will align provider and patient psychology and economics with appropriate antibiotic use in both humans and animals. We have to stop relying solely on traditional local tactics. We need new business models and regulatory reform to develop treatment for unmet need. We need to focus on push incentives, public-private partnerships, and streamlined development. We need to stop viewing our relationship with microbes as a war. There's no end game. We're never going to kill them off. Let's try to figure out how to disarm or discourage them instead. We need to take the long view. We need policies that seek sustainability over centuries, not policies that seek one-time victories in five to 10 years. I will close with uh, acknowledgments of key people who have influenced me over the years on this topic, and we can now open the floor to questions. Dr. Spelberg, thank you so much for your stimulating presentation. Great talk. We have some questions that have been sent to us from some of the participants. If you'd like to go ahead and um, answer, describe some of those questions and give your, your thoughtful comments to them. Well, we've had a ton of questions. Are there any, Marty, that have caught your eye? Um, let's see. One came through uh, initially when you were discussing your alternative approaches to antimicrobials, and that was um, related to the use of bacteriophages um, as a strategy or a, a combination therapy to antimicrobials. So I think we are interested, in, I think the scientific community is interested in bacteriophages. We need to acknowledge that the data are not there at this time to support their use. I, link, I, I sort of have described publicly bacteriophages as being a, a little bit akin to Bigfoot. You know, after 80 years of grainy footage of people dressed up in a suit in the forest, you want somebody to go out into the forest and capture Bigfoot and bring him to the zoo. The, the bacteriophages have been around forever. What we need are randomized controlled trials that show they work for invasive infections. I believe they've been established to be effective for diarrheal illnesses. They are probably effective topically, although we still don't have randomized trials to prove that. For invasive infections, we're gonna need gold standard clinical trials and we're completely open to them. We should keep in mind, there is gonna be resistance that emerges to bacteriophages like anything else. So they're not a panacea, but certainly they may be an important partial solution. We need the clinical trials to show that they work. Thank you. Um, another topic that you brought up was also, rethinking clinical trial design, and if, if we're targeting specific multidrug resistant organisms at potentially multi-body sites, a couple of things come to mind, which is the role of diagnostics in the clinical trial uh, development, as well as the, the role of pharmacokinetics and dynamics such that the antimicrobials can potentially reach those different body sites at the right dose. Yeah, well, we do. Diagnostics. Diagnostics we need for unmet need, period. Even if you're only enrolling at one body set, we want to get drugs for Pseudomonas acinetobacter CRE. I, to, to, it, our need is pathogen specific, not site specific. And rapid diagnostics will help us enroll patients with the target pathogens in the trials. No question about that. Everyone agrees with that. Um, I think the primary problem with multi-site infections, turns out not so much to be pharmacology. In most cases, most small molecules get into most tissues. There are rare exceptions, and you must prove before the trial is done that, that the PK is relevant for that drug. The real issue is statistically, how do you combine data across body sites? That was the challenge that uh, the Berry consultants have taken on, and, and will present on December 7th their thoughts about how to do that. The other, the other, at the beginning of your talk, you brought up the utilization of antimicrobials. Is, uh, there's a lot of it that goes into the animals um, for animal husbandry. And we had a question about what, how do you see animal and human health professionals working together on this in the antimicrobial stewardship field? 
Yeah, well, I mean, the animal situation is difficult. It's a political problem. It's an economic problem. Recent economic analysis suggests that there actually isn't much economic benefit for growth from ocean in 2016. That with modern farming techniques, the antibiotics actually don't add very much relative to how much they cost. That actually is not a scientific problem per se. It's really a political and social problem. And I actually think it's been so difficult to get legislation in the space that probably the most impactful short to midterm solution is market forces. Uh, consumers are increasingly demanding antibiotic free meat. And I think, um, you know, companies are responding. There are many companies, Purdue Chicken, for example, and many retail uh, chain food stores are now specifically saying they won't use meat that has been grown with antibiotics. I think that trend is going to continue. And over time, as more and more concern is, is made apparent, that eventually, hopefully, we'll have some legislation that backs the market forces. Uh, another question um, is also you talked about fear. And the, the prescribing comes from fear, which is related to worry that you'll have a negative outcome in the patient, so such that you select your most broad-spectrum antimicrobial. Do you feel that the responsibility then for the prescribing and the outcomes needs to be shared across all healthcare professionals? Yeah, well, it's more than that. Prescribing needs to be shared across every member of our society, both patient and providers. There are ways to think about this that I, in part that I was alluding to. If hospitals, healthcare systems, and providers have their prescription habits publicly reported and have their Medicare payments modulated by whether they overprescribe or underprescribe, you will begin to align the interests of the providers with not overprescribing. The fear of making a mistake will be counterbalanced by the self-preservation desire to not be publicly embarrassed by being an overprescriber. And at the hospital level, they will apply pressure to you. We're getting a cut in Medicare payment because you're overprescribing. You need to rein it in. That's what I mean by grand strategy. The power of public reporting and linking the performance publicly to payment can align all of our interests in the same direction. I think that achieves what the excellent person who asked that question was asking. Well, thank you, Dr. Spielberg. We are out of time for this webinar, so we're going to conclude the Antimicrobial Stewardship Project webinar today. And we'd like to thank all of our participants for participating in this program, as well as your stimulating questions. We, we all appreciate your support in the community as we seek to have pushed the agenda related to antimicrobial stewardship. Thank you, Dr. Spellberg.